Okay, this is our first podcast of Unit 5. I'm at the top of page 2. Now on the front, nomenclature. Nomenclature is all about writing our compounds and our naming of what we use, our compounds. But before we really talk about the naming, we need to know that there's different types of compounds, and different types of compounds get named differently. So we're going to talk about first why they make compounds. So why does a bond occur? Okay, now a bond is just what holds two elements together. Okay, so a bond will hold two elements together to make a compound. So why does that happen? Well, and we're at the top, you can fill in the blanks. If the potential energy is decreased, which means energy is released, then two atoms are going to form a bond because lower energy means greater stability. And that's what this picture is showing. So this is why even hydrogen, we talk about our diatomics, two hydrogen atoms, so this is when they're individual atoms here, this is if they're too close, right here is like the perfect distance, just kind of like Goldilocks. This is the perfect distance, there's a bond that's holding these two atoms together. We will symbolize it with a line, but there's an overlap and there are actually sharing electrons. So how we classify is based on that property of electro electronegativity, which again is the measure of an atom's ability to attract electrons. <clears throat> so that's in a compound if they're sharing, how nicely are they sharing? And remember in our trend, fluorine is the highest. Well, what happens is you have a chart, and here's your chart. So if you look at these numbers, again, look at fluorine is the highest. Now, you don't ever have to memorize these numbers, but we're going to talk about how we take a shortcut when we're looking at it. So where it is classified depends on the electronegativity difference. So you will subtract it as you're going through it. And so this is where right here is the net difference in the electronegativity. So we have kind of a scale. And we say that if the difference between the two elements it falls in the range of 4.0 and 1.7, we would classify that as an ionic bond. Because look what this is meaning. This means that it's very, very uneven, that there's a big electronegativity difference. So this again is a large electronegativity difference. Try and figure out a shortcut. There we go, difference. Okay, then we have in the middle range then, this is covalent, they're going to start sharing, but we do have some classifications. This is a polar covalent, which means it's kind of a medium range, but it's an uneven sharing of the electrons because there's still quite of a large difference there. Now look at down here. If this is a small, okay, very small, difference. This means it's very evenly sharing. We would classify, again, it's covalent because they're being shared, but we say that they are nonpolar covalent because it means they're being evenly shared. This is a pretty small difference. Not very many elements actually fall in that range. Mostly your diatomics. Okay, so down here what you're using is that periodic table. So it says, okay, what's the difference between these? Well, if you look it up, they're the same thing. So I'm looking at, excuse me, this right here, 2.5. So 2.5 minus 2.5, well, the electronegativity difference is zero. That means it's falling in the nonpolar covalent category. Okay, so between potassium and fluoride. So potassium's over here at a 0.8. Fluoride we know is a 4. Net difference, just subtract so you get a positive number. We don't want negatives. So that is a difference of 3.2. So that falls in the ionic range. Okay, calcium oxide. Same thing, calcium's a 1.0, oxygen 3.5. So that falls in the 2.5, again, ionic range. Now this carbon and hydrogen, if you notice, it's the, one of the smallest ones. It's still, it's on that point four. It's, okay, we know it's covalent. 
it is technically kind of falling in that polar range. It's really, really close. Most of the time we even say this is a nonpolar bond. It's not cut and dry. And we, when we start drawing the shapes, we'll talk a lot more about that. So you're probably going, okay, so which has the most covalent? The most covalent means it has the smallest difference. Well, the ones, okay, diatomics. This is a good fact to know. Diatomics are the most covalent. And remember, a diatomic means you have I2, H2, N2. Those are diatomics. Because electronegativity is the difference is the same, then you're going to see. Okay, well, do I have to memorize this whole chart? No. So here's our shortcut. Okay, we know we have our line, right? So look at where these are. You have your larger ionization and or, or electronegativities is where you have the smallest. So what do we say? So at the bottom here, let's actually, all my numbers just disappeared, but write yourself something. Okay, so ionics in. We know that they're going to be where you get the largest one is between a metal and a nonmetal. And then covalence are going to be between nonmetals only. Okay, and then we're going to worry about that polar nonpolar once we get a little bit more information. So for right now, we're not going to have to worry so much if it's polar or nonpolar, but we will when we get back from the break, meaning the Christmas break. Okay, so on the next page, let's look at some of the properties they have, differences. So again, at the top or somewhere, reminding yourself, how do I know? Well, it's between a metal and a non-metal. You know what? I have this written at the bottom. Okay, it's right here. I guess you don't have to write it again. But you do have to highlight that. Know that. Absolutely, positively, you need to know this for the rest of the year. Okay, so look at what ionic bonds are saying. That you transfer the electrons. This is with pluses and minus. Or in other words, what do you have? Cations and ions. And, excuse me, anions because we're talking about transferring electrons. So that would be actually a very good thing to add. We say they, they transfer electrons, meaning something's fully charged. Sodium lost an electron. Um, chlorine gained an electron. So look at metal, nonmetal. They're technically called formula units. Just if you see that word show up, a formula unit, because they're formed of a lattice. Of them. They don't exist as one little molecule, but they exist as a network. They're more of a network. Okay, covalence. We think of covalence as sharing electrons. They're going to be sharing. Now look at this. Nonpolar means here's my little electrons, that they're evenly shared between them. If something is polar, see how this atom has more of the electron. It's taking more than its share. If we had the electron cloud, it would be more around this atom than this. Even though they're sharing it, they're not sharing it evenly. So we call these molecules, and again, they're between nonmetals. Now if we look at these, these are actually, these would be classified are nonpolar. For right now, just kind of know those are your nonpolars. These are my polar. Okay, these are actually called polyatomic, polyatomic ions. And we're going to be using these, but these are actually covalently bonded. But they're covalently bonded, but you know what they're going to be able to do is make an ionic compound. So they're going to actually have some of both going on in there. Okay, um, metallics. Good word to know here. C of electrons. The electrons are delocalized. So this is your positive nucleus. And if you look at it, it's a sea of electrons, meaning these electrons can travel. This is why all the properties of metals, they're malleable because these electrons can move. They are flexible. They're not rigid. So when we look at the different properties, you're going to have to be able to go back and talk about what kind of bonding it has in it. OK, so we just say, OK, what is measure the strength? Okay, lattice energy, here's the definition. Energy released when one mole of compound is formed from a gas. Okay, this is a physical property. 
Okay, let's go over to this one, heat of vaporization. And again, when you get, you're going to vaporize, which means we're going from a liquid to a gas. Again, this is looking at a physical property. So we just want to know the attraction holding the molecules. How much is it going to take? But look at bond energy. This is energy required to break a bond. This is actually using a chemical property to describe it, because you actually would have to break the bond to form something new. Reason they don't form, these guys form, um, you can separate them. This already exists as a lone molecule, so you have to actually break that bond, not just the attraction between the molecules. Let's look at some of their um, properties. So let's just go down ionic compounds. Ionics have high melting points, high boiling points. We're actually going to do an activity to see if you, that we can kind of verify this. Um, ionics are all solids. Man, this is a good one to know. Okay, most, depends on this, are fairly good dissolving in water. Okay, let's look at the covalent. So I'm only going part way down and then I'll go to the next screen. They have low melting points, low boiling points. Okay, you can have solid, liquid gases, sugar, water, carbon monoxide. Solubility in water, it depends. If it's polar, yes, it's going to dissolve. Nonpolar, no, it's not going to dissolve. We will be talking about this next semester. Okay, metal, metals, we know that they have high melting points, high boiling points. They're all solid, well, except for mercury. And they are not soluble. Hopefully that you know that. You throw in some copper into water, it's not going to dissolve. Okay, now we talk about conductivity. This is a good one to tell the difference. This is how you can tell if something is ionic. Because you, can you see in the future that we give you properties on a test and you have to tell us what kind of bonding is going on and what kind of compound it is? So solids, they do not conduct when they're a solid. When they're molten, yes. And it's all about movement of ions. Okay, if you dissolve in water, is it going to conduct? Yes. So we say good conductors, that isn't actually shouldn't be here, good conductors should be over here. Sorry, that's more metallic property. Okay, so covalents are poor conductors. They are, um, they vary slightly, polar might a little bit slightly, that's why I get out of the water when there's electricity, but overall we say covalents are poor conductors. Okay, metals, they're good conductors. Okay, they're um, ductile and malleable. So those are, again, those vo vo um, vocab. Ductile, you can pull it into a wire. Malleable, you can bend it into a sheet. Okay, so look at the questions at the bottom there. Those are some questions you're going to talk about, we will talk about in class. And then, like I said, we're going to do kind of an activity and see if we can actually kind of test some of these properties. So we will see you when we see you.